tutti, benvenuti a questa lezione magistrale di Joan von Guberta. Eh, abbiamo un programma eh, interessante, eh, avremo la, la, la lezione del, del professore e dopodiché ehm, i colleghi interverranno e porranno alcuni spunti di riflessione al, al nostro relatore ospite che ringrazio finora per essere, per essere qui, per essere si è reso disponibile e mh, per la sua pazienza anche eh, visto un attimo il dilatarsi dei tempi anche se vedo che è un quarto d'ora accademico e quindi siamo a tutti gli effetti nei ranghi. Eh, quindi buona, buonasera a tutti. L'evento è anche appunto eh, registrato, sarà reso disponibile poi sui canali del, sul sito dell'Università di Verona. Ma prima di cominciare lascio la parola a, ehm, a Federico ehm, che mi ha appunto anche invitato a partecipare a questo, a questo pomeriggio e che ringrazio molto. Grazie a te, io mh, prendo solo un minuto per dire che questo evento che è molto importante è una grande occasione per noi ascoltare Juan Font Cuberta che ringrazio a mia volta di cuore. Questo evento nasce dalla confluenza di alcuni eh, incontri e anche di alcuni organismi che mi piace ricordare. Eh, alla mia sinistra siede Fabio Benincasa che è un amico da tanti anni e che ha offerto il primo legame, no? il primo contatto con Juan Font Cuberta e quindi mi fa piacere ricordare il suo contributo importante, anzi decisivo, alla diciamo, possibilità di questo incontro. E ricordo appunto lui, il suo lavoro al Museo delle Periferie di Roma, con cui abbiamo fatto vari incontri, discussioni, pubblicazioni, anche stiamo iniziando. Quindi, eh, senz'altro, la figura di Fabio e il Museo delle Periferie di Roma sono uno degli organismi che hanno contribuito alla possibilità di questo ascolto della parola e anche delle immagini di Juan Font Cuberta. Poi mi piace ricordare Simone Azzoni, che adesso non vedo più, ma che è qui con Eccolo, perché era molto in fondo, ma che ha avuto di nuovo un ruolo molto importante. Lui è eh, l'ideatore e il curatore di un festival molto bello, molto originale, che senz'altro conoscerete, che si chiama Grenze, che lavora appunto sulla fotografia e che ha promosso una forma, posso dire, di ospitalità nei confronti del lavoro di Font Cuberta qui a Verona. C'è una mostra che si intitola Déjà Vu, e che vi segnalo, e dunque sono molto grato anche a Simone Azzoni perché è l'altro eh, contatto efficace e l'idea soprattutto di mettere questo incontro dentro a una geometria fatta anche di altri punti, tra cui il Festival Grenze, tra cui la mostra che attualmente è alla Galleria Isolo 17, quindi qui vicino, in via 20 settembre. Appunto il suo è stato un contributo molto molto importante e poi ultima realtà che mi piace citare, eh, insieme a Contemporanea, che è il contenitore più generale del Dipartimento di Scienze Umane, dentro cui sta questa iniziativa, come tante altre che tematizzano forme di arte contemporanea e di attenzione al mondo contemporaneo, è il centro di ricerca film, PHILM, cioè filosofia e film, filosofia e cinema, che è stato ideato, fondato e che viene curato dall'amico e collega Gianluca Solla, che è qui con noi, e anche alla realtà di film dobbiamo eh, un pezzetto, diciamo, dell'organizzazione, della possibilità di questo evento. Dunque, come tutti gli incontri, è un incontro di molti incontri e di molte realtà, diciamo, che lo hanno sostanziato e concretizzato e mi faceva piacere citarle tutte e a tutte dire un grazie molto sentito. Grazie. Eh, bene, allora possiamo procedere. Eh, è mio dovere, onere e onore introdurre eh, Joan von Guberta che è il caso di dire non ha, non ha bisogno di molte presentazioni perché immagino lo conosciate tutti e magari chi non lo conosce ancora bene avrà avuto modo sapendo di questo incontro di approfondire la figura eh, che dire è eh, tra i più importanti e, e, mh, riferimenti eh, nello studio oggi dell'immagine dell contemporanea eh, figura che 
fonde eh, l'aspetto la, teorico di ricerca a quello sperimentale della pratica fotografica perché Fontcuberta è artista, fotografo, è ricercatore, docente, insegna comunicazione audiovisiva all'Università Pompeo Fabra di Barcellona e ha all'attivo appunto diversi interventi eh, come curatore, come ricercatore e come docente. Um, sua opera è esposta e collezionata ai più importanti musei internazionali, dal Museo delle Scienze di Londra al MoMA di New York. Um, L'occasione, uh, credo anche, di questo, di questo incontro di oggi è la recente eh, interessante ripubblicazione del Bacio di Giuda, Fotografie e Verità, che è la prima edizione italiana di questo testo, o meglio, di questa raccolta di testi pubblicati in francese nel 1996 e, e ho trovato questa nota molto interessante della, diciamo, della, della prefazione e presentazione che un altro collega di Visual Studies, Michele Smargiassi, fa a questa edizione italiana, dice quando questo libro, oggi testo fondamentale teorico di Fontcuberta, venne pubblicato nel 1996 in Francia, era un libro appunto sull'immagine fotografica, eravamo otto anni prima eh, della nascita di Facebook, cinque anni prima che il cellulare, il cellulare si trasformasse in fotocamera e 14 anni prima di Instagram. Quindi immaginatevi voi stessi che oggi potete leggere questi testi in italiano, dovete fare uno sforzo di trasposizione nel tempo e nei media e rientrare in una categoria che era precedente a questi device e strumenti. Eh, non mi dilungo oltre, dicevo, proprio perché se no eh, eh, togliamo anche tempo al nostro ospite e quindi lascio la parola a lei, professor Foncuberta, prego. Grazie, buonasera. Uh, mi dispiace non parlare italiano, allora uh, inglese. Um, The first thing I would like to say is that um, I've been always teaching. I teach to learn. Uh, I don't consider, as uh, I've been presented by Luca, as a theorician or as a researcher or so. I'm, I'm an artist, I'm a photographer, but I have curiosity. And because of this curiosity, I expand the, the territory of my practice to other fields. Um, teaching, or pedagogy, uh, which uh, has been one of my uh, own life activities, uh, is not something apart, separated from my creative work. Instead, I believe that the fact that you share your experience or you try to explain your experience is part of the artist's duty. And that is my standpoint. So when I'm presented uh, as a thinker or a theorician or even uh, an image philosopher, I feel a little ashamed. I'm much more modest. <laughs> I'm just a, a, an image producer, but I feel that uh, images uh, are not just, uh, you know, uh, significative surfaces, but uh, the, the, the way that uh, we use to negotiate our model of reality. And because of that, uh, they um, format our mind, they format our conscience. So producing, fabricating images implies a very strong responsibility. And I try to deal with this idea of the responsibility of images. Um, in order to present today a kind of uh, summarized content. Uh, first of all, I would like to state that uh, what I'm going to present now is because I'm doing uh, that exhibition, the Jabi, together with uh, my uh, artist partner, Pilar Rosado, uh, in the context, in the program of uh, Grense Festival uh, in Verona. And, and, and I would invite you to visit this exhibition because somehow now I will provide a kind of a context, an overview. I mean, how I, Pilar and I arrived to produce uh, this kind of uh, proposal, this kind of project. And uh, uh, in order to do so, uh, allow me to use images as a methodological explanatory tool Images are universal language better than uh, 
Catalan, my native language or Italian or whatever. So I will just project slides and comment them in order to articulate a uh, uh, speech, okay? So first of all, uh, mm, let me uh, just uh, share with you my screen. Is anything happening? No. Yeah, we see uh, all the images. What What do you see? Excuse me. Series <laughs> of little images okay. on the slides of your presentation. This is not. This is not the correct thing. Probably we see what you see. Okay. I I start again. Sorry. Oh, no, no problem. Una presentazione F5 di solito. Ok. Ah. Now you see just the text, right? Yeah, it's perfect now. Thanks. Okay. So, first of all, the, the title. Uh, of course, <laughs> when uh, you are requested to provide a title a uh, month in advance, you provide a, a kind of generic idea and then you think, well, I will, I will try to improvise whatever. In this case, uh, it's about the exhibition here in Verona, but also about uh, the importance of archive in, in my work. Uh, I'm mostly well known because of my former uh, fictional narrative. So I started, uh, my career started in the 70s and at that time, uh, because of the authority of documentary photography, uh, I, I wanted to challenge the concept of truth, of evidence. Uh, photography was presented as a literal translation of reality. And uh, I wish to uh, discuss, to go farther, what was uh, this meaning. And because of that, I, I start producing different projects in which I confronted viewers with the veracity underlying image. No? So it was like a, a, a trick or a, a kind of <laughs> uh, provoking the doubt. So I was an advocate of doubt regarding the uh, photographic uh, document uh, veracity, okay? But uh, little by little, of course, I've been evolved. The world has been evolved. Uh, history hasn't stopped. And uh, today I'm more concerned with um, other, other problems. I mean, I, I, I don't refuse my first steps, but uh, I'm interested in expanding the, the reflection I'm doing on the photographic medium and on visual culture in general. So uh, today I'm interested in the uh, idea, in the proposal, of post-photography. Post-photography maybe is an ambiguous term. Maybe we should uh, look for another more accurate word, but it relates the fact that the photography, which was born in 19th century, is completely different from photography that we have in 20th, 21st century. So which are the difference? Uh, let me try to provide some, some uh, ideas, some comments on that. Of course, uh, not from a dogmatic point of view, but uh, these are just my impressions. Photography was the hair of the industrial revolution and the uh, techno-scientific culture of 19th century. And because of that, it embodied different values. First, from the political or economical point of view, uh, photography was a kind of um, symbolical appropriation of reality. In 19th century was the moment of uh, the colonial, uh, you know, colonial movements. Um, photography was always preceding a military army. When uh, European metropolis, uh, the British, the Italian, the French, the, uh, wished 
to conquer uh, an unknown uh, territory, first they sent photographers, maybe included in scientific expeditions, but the photographer always preceded the army, you know, with, with a flag saying, okay, now this belongs to us. So photography was not innocent. Photography was not naive. Photography was a, an element of power. Okay, second, from a cultural or social point of view, photography was a kind of um, certification of, uh, of, of truth. Of, of, it was a way to uh, verify the authenticity of a fact. What we see is exactly what happened in front of the camera. This was the equation that uh, uh, culturally we accepted. And in another level, it was a way to uh, create an encyclopedia of visual experience. And third, maybe the most unknown, but also very important <laughs> is that uh, uh, from uh, some, some parameters from the um, religious or, or spiritual point of view. Photography was uh, promising eternity. This means that uh, our body could die and disappear, but our picture will remain forever. And secondly, photography was a kind of a magic substitution of reality. When the body is missing, uh, the photograph is uh, somehow uh, uh, adopting the place of uh, this absence. Okay, so this to me are the elements which would define uh, photography as uh, we have uh, uh, known up to now. But little by little, this has been evolving. Of course, the, the world, the economy, the, the politics, the, the way of thinking of 19th century is completely different of uh, now the, the, the situation now. We have uh, you know, this kind of uh, global uh, world, we have uh, these uh, virtual economies, we have these uh, 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 new kinds of um, I don't know, uh, hyper modernity and, and this kind of uh, philosophical uh, ways of thinking and so on. So photography should accommodate its function to uh, this new uh, situation. And uh, all those values are evolving, are maybe vanishing. Hmm? For instance, the idea of truth or the idea of memory nowadays are uh, somehow um, more conflictive. There are no dogmas anymore. Uh, truth is not an obsession as it was in uh, 19th and 20th century. It's just an option, okay? And uh, uh, memory, I mean, photographs were intended to keep some uh, memory, but now we can take photographs, send them by email or by, uh, you know, our cell phones and they reach uh, another one. And after reading the information in that uh, photographic message, they can be deleted. Huh? Um, destroying a photograph uh, just maybe uh, 30, 40 years a, a, ago, it could be considered a sin. It could be a disaster. Photographs were like precious uh, elements that uh, we, we kept. Huh? And, and instead today, uh, photographs are, are not uh, this kind of uh, solemn um, elements, but just a kind of a communicative uh, item. And because of that, our relationship with photography has changed. Okay, so a uh, few months ago, I did in Barcelona uh, uh, an exhibition whose title was Monsters. And uh, the, 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 the title, Monsters, derived from uh, a quotation uh, by Antonio Gramsci. You know, uh, il vecchio mondo sta morendo, uh, uh, quello, uh, <laughs> quello novo, eh, 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 in, just a second, I'm not able. Uh, 
Well, the, the thing was, uh, I cannot uh, repeat that in, in, in Italian, sorry. Uh, uh, the idea was um, uh, that the old world is dying. Uh, the new one uh, has a lot of difficulties to, to, to emerge. And in, in between, in the uh, chiaro oscuro, uh, nascono i monstri. Eh? Okay. Of course, Gramsci was uh, thinking uh, about uh, the, the political regime, uh, the, 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 the bourgeois uh, um, degenerated democracies were dying and the revolutionary uh, state was having a lot of time, a lot of difficulty to, to, to born. And in between, there were those monsters. Well, the first thing I like in this uh, quotation is that it's fake. <laughs> Gramsci never wrote doubt when he was in prison because being a revolutionary against the, the fascist uh, uh, movement. Uh, it seems that uh, this is a, a kind of uh, um, decorated translation Slavov Sisek did when uh, he, he translated uh, the Italian uh, text into the English ones. And uh, I like this, um, you know, uh, different stratification of meanings when the, the quotation, the meaning of the quotation itself, but also all the surrounding in which the, the cultural, ideological, political landscape is uh, changing a little bit the, the, the words. Maybe the meaning is more or less the same, but the, the, the words uh, uh, are, are, are different. Well, in this exhibition, I uh, transferred the emergence of monsters to the idea of uh, the evolution from the analog photography to the digital photography. So analog photography was the old world and digital photography, post photography is the new world. And in between, we are in a no man's land in which absolutely the monsters emerge. Well, these are photographs of um, this, uh, this, this exhibition. And now I will uh, explain how I arrive uh, to uh, this position. First of all, let, let me tell uh, uh, an interesting um, story. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2013, I participated in uh, an expedition to the North Pole organized by the Gothenburg University in Sweden. And this uh, expedition composed by artists and scientists were following the path of a 19th century expedition of these three guys. Uh, Salomon André, uh, who was an engineer, Luke Frankel, and um, the, um, the third one, um, I, I don't remember now how it was called, uh, who was uh, Strindberg. Uh, who was the nephew of August Strindberg. Uh, Neil Strindberg was a photographer and a cartographer. In 19th century, the conquest of the Arctic and the Antarctic were so challenging as in the next century, in the 60s, was the conquest of the moon. And uh, if in 20th century, the, the two rivals were the United States and the Soviet Union, in 19th century, in order to uh, get the, 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 the North Pole, uh, Russians, uh, Scandinavians, British, Canadians, there were different nations trying to be successful in that uh, enterprise uh, because it was a kind of a patriotic endeavor. Hmm? So, uh, mm, the, the Swedish tried to uh, organize uh, an expedition, uh, you will understand why I explain all these details, using a mongolfi, a balloon, a balloon with uh, uh, the, the hydrogen built in Paris, and which uh, was supposed to allow uh, the, 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 what, the, the adventurers uh, to uh, circumnavigate the North Pole. Okay. They were sponsored by Alfred Nobel, philanthropist, and it was a kind of patriotic event with the, the king in a military parade saying farewell for that. 
So uh, I, I go fast. Uh, this, this is a story that uh, uh, it, it's very well known in European Nordic countries, but not so well known in, in Spain or Italy or other meridional European countries. So the, the thing is that uh, they, they, they left from Svalbard, from the Spitsbergen uh, island, and uh, tried to uh, fly north. But after three days of navigation, the uh, balloon uh, had problems, uh, lost the gas, and finally fell uh, on, on the ice uh, desert. They were for a month trying to uh, wait for a rescue expedition, but uh, they were never found and were officially declared um, missing, More, maybe death. Just 33 years later, a whaler, a ship hunting whales, was able, just luckily, to find their last camp. And in that last camp, they found the three bodies, of course, uh, dead. But also, what interests us is that, that they found the camera Niels Strindberg used and the films he exposed, of course, very damaged and so on. Well, I was fascinated at that story and at the photographs they found. So uh, after that uh, uh, expedition with uh, with the ship uh, to the North Pole, uh, I've been traveling to Sweden several times in order to do some research. In Grena, which is the um, town in which uh, uh, Andre, Salomon Andre was born. Grena is uh, in between Gothenburg and, and Stockholm. Uh, they have a museum completely dedicated to uh, this, uh, this adventure. Huh? So there are replicas of the Montgolfier, there are photographs, and all the uh, photographs that they found, all the elements are in that museum. I photograph everything. For instance, this is the, the watch of uh, one of the travelers, eh? uh, which is stopped exactly in that precise time. And it, that's very symbolic. The, the wallet with photographs, maps, drawings that uh, they did, this was on, on, the, on the west, on the coat of the expeditioners. In the case of um, Strindberg, uh, they found in a very poor shape, the photograph of her fiance, uh, her lover, uh, um, Charlotte, uh, and, uh, and uh, it seems that uh, Strindberg promised to marry her after returning uh, of a successful uh, uh, travel. Uh. Well, these are the anecdotes which are like a, a spicy, <laughs> the spicy aspect of this story. What interests us are the photographs taken during that expedition. Of course, photographs which were in very poor conditions during 33 years, ice, water, whatever. But they were processed and these are the results. These are some images with a lot of damage, with a lot of noise, with a lot of imperfection, but which explain, they document, they are the witness of what happened. For instance, uh, here we have some difficulties to uh, decode the image, but we see that two of the two of the travelers uh, are on the eyes and killing a, a bear. Huh? During three three months, they were killing bears and other animals uh, in order to survive. Huh? And uh, photographs of the landscape, of course, these are terrible in in terms of um, technical quality. But uh, I understand that. Uh, uh, these images overlap. There are different uh, layers of information. At one hand, they provide the recording of reality, of uh, the landscape, of uh, the travelers, of the balloon, and so on. But this kind of noise, this kind of damage, uh, it's speaking about the suffering of the image itself. So usually in history, photography has been dealing with human trauma. If we close our eyes and thought about uh, uh, which are the most iconic uh, 
photographs that we can remember. Probably we will think of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima or the Vietnam uh, you know, execution, or uh, I don't know. There are several, several images, but they always deal with uh, war, with uh, violence, with conflict, with death, with suffering. So photography historically has been depicting human trauma. But now, if we realize in these pictures, uh, the, the photographs are alive agents. They have their own metabolism. And we can talk about the trauma inherent in its own nature. So there are two traumas. The trauma of what was happening, for instance, in this case, all the, all the suffering of the three travelers that after uh, several, several months, they, they were, uh, uh, you know, damned. They were uh, dying because of uh, cold, because of uh, uh, hunger and so on. And the trauma of pictures of the negatives that survive these 23, uh, 33 years uh, in those uh, harsh conditions. So this gave me the idea of, uh, you know, uh, dealing with uh, the, 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 the a project, an, an ongoing project, which is trauma. What's trauma? Well, trauma consists on going to archives, and now I start talking about the archive, uh, because uh, to me, uh, one of the um, parameters of this new post-photographic period is the fact that uh, we have a kind of massification of images. There's uh, such a saturation, a visual saturation, that may be the, the rule of the photographer or the rule of uh, any uh, artist is uh, no longer to contribute producing this uh, kind of um, overabundance of images, eh? but instead a kind of ecology, of visual ecology. And because of that, uh, maybe we have uh, two different ways. One, it could be uh, an intelligent, a critical uh, management of this uh, massification. I mean, what to do with the images that already exist in order to uh, let them uh, have another life and express with another voice, a new voice, or uh, the, 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 the search for the missing images, those missing these, those images which uh, never existed or that existed, but were destroyed or censored or uh, somehow having problems to uh, be diffused. And one of the sanctuaries where you can find this abundance of images is uh, of course uh, archives. Okay, during the pandemics, uh, I was thinking in all these matters and uh, I was visiting different uh, archives. For instance, uh, this is the National Archive of Catalonia, very close where I, am, I live. And I was also fascinated at another, uh, an another detail. Uh, when they have um, documents, photographs, uh, maps, uh, letters, whatever, which are infected, they um, discard them in a specific room, which is called purgatory. I love that, I mean, purgatory. When photographs are being <laughs> damaged uh, at this point, in order to prevent, to infect healthy documents, they are isolated as we were during the pandemic uh, lockdown. Huh? What you see now, believe or not, these are uh, photographs taken during the Spanish Civil War. They were taken on a nitrite of cellulose uh, film, which was intended for, um, for uh, cinema, not for photography, but because of the, the, the war problems, it was the only available material to a lot of photographers. So they were using this material, which is not uh, very stable, and uh, humidity and other microorganisms provide uh, this kind of destruction. So I was interested in this kind of uh, situation. Uh, first, because it was a way to uh, somehow recycle uh, this material, but also for another reason. 
which is the fact that uh, it's it's this is talking about the end of uh, photographs as objects as physical matter huh? the the end of materiality and this is a question which interests me a lot uh, how materiality somehow is the support for memory in order to have some memory uh, we need uh, a physical a tangible something a haptic that you can touch huh? and uh, I, I, in in my exhibition monsters at one hand i was dealing with uh, these uh, damaged photographs found in archives and the new uh, digital algorithmic photographs that uh, I will uh, explain later. But it was this kind of transition. And because of this idea of materiality, I realized how important uh, the, the presence, the material uh, dimension of the photograph is. And, uh, I, I would like to provide just two uh, very uh, colorful examples. First, the flat dallies. I don't know if you are familiar with this situation. When the American army sent troops to um, Eastern countries like uh, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq or so, probably uh, the soldiers should stay there for a long period and then uh, creates uh, the, the, the absence of, of uh, uh, that uh, man creates a, uh, a sense of loss in the family. So the psychologist of the army thought that it was a good idea, and this is quite crazy, to produce uh, life-size reproductions of the soldiers and send those reproductions uh, to the family. So uh, the, the soldier was uh, in the front, maybe he was going to die and never come back, but at least they, they could, I mean, the family, the kids, uh, the, the wives, uh, so on, were able to uh, have this kind of symbolic uh, substitution, what I said, uh, the, the, the spiritual and religious meaning of, of uh, photographs, and having this, this uh, magic, uh, this magic relationship um, with uh, with uh, with the real, which is uh, which is missing. Okay, so this is an example, and I'm sure that uh, you will say, okay, that's a fake, and we don't believe, etc. <laughs> Either you check that in in Wikipedia, in Google, you can find it now. If you have your cell phones, you can check that. Uh, I'm not inventing that, but it's something which uh, really happened. Okay, this is in America. Well, let's let's go to your place. Let's go to Italy. And probably you know the case during again the pandemics of the priest Giuseppe Corbari from uh, Robiano, close to Milano, that um, was uh, having mass since uh, the, the church was empty because all the people uh, should stay at home. He said, "Okay, uh, if you are not coming, at least send your portraits, and I will do the religious service." Uh, in front of your uh, photographs. So, uh, making a joke, I mean, uh, if, if uh, you know, according to the Christian uh, rules, uh, you should go to Mass on Sunday. Um, in this case, I think that uh, God accepted that uh, if the circumstances don't allow that you go physically to the church, at least uh, your, your uh, photograph will substitute you and then it's it's no longer a scene. You are a good Christian doing that. Huh? Well, sorry for, for the bad joke, but it's a way which proves at, at, at which level uh, the, the, the photograph somehow, uh, somehow is, is the, the replica, the substitution of ourself. Huh? And this idea of materiality has been uh, very frequent uh, in, in my own work. I could uh, show several projects, but uh, I will just pick up one of them, which is called Gastropoda, because it was uh, it was exhibited in Italy, and maybe uh, you are familiar with that. Huh? I, I don't live in the in in a city. I live in the countryside, in a very humid uh, area, and uh, I have my post box outside on on the street, and uh, when the Postman delivers uh, letters, uh, the, the, the snails arrive and eat the paper. At the beginning, um, I, I was pissed off at that situation, but then little by little, I understood that uh, snails were helping me to create new images. 
in a kind of uh, deconstructive way eh? because snails were eating the, the, the surface, the, the, the skin, the epidermic layer of the image going into the entrails. So uh, when I understood that method, uh, immediately I let snails work for me. They were somehow doing my job. They were transforming the images. And from time to time, I was checking, checking uh, at which kind of uh, transformation the, the, the photographs uh, did arrive. No? Which kind of material I received from the postman? Mainly invoices, so if the snails in them, it's even better. But uh, also a lot of invitation cards from museums and galleries. And those invitation cards usually uh, reproduce artworks, a painting, a photograph, whatever. So somehow those nails could be considered as photophagos, eaters of photographs, or artphagos, eh? eaters of art. And I like this idea of uh, some living beings being uh, nourished, eh? being fed with art with images, with pictures. So these are just some examples. And here, more than the final result, I'm interested uh, in, in the process. For instance, this is the installation I did in a museum in Spain. You see that I present a kind of aquarium with uh, two dozens of uh, wild snails. And uh, they are on uh, you know, a layer of uh, different uh, invitation cards printed, published by that museum. And from time to time, I check the result and I remove, I, I select several of the invitation cards, I photograph them, I enlarge them, and I display them on the uh, gallery walls with the proper frame, lighting, uh, caption, and so on. Inside the aquarium, they are just debris, they are just leftovers, garbage, rubbish. Even with the, you know, with the sheet of the snails and everything. But when you transfer them on the exhibition space, they become artworks. So it's a kind of a ironical metamorphosis. When I'm not able to install the aquarium with the actual snails, then I present uh, the, the, the video uh, that I've been uh, shooting in preceding uh, presentations. And it's a quite uh, astonishing uh, video in which you see in close up how the snails eat the, the, the paper and destroy the image. Huh? It's also a play for uh, slow food huh? in a moment in which uh, fast food is the the usual trend, uh, going back to this idea of uh, 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 loneliness, it's uh, much more interesting. And the idea that uh, photographs are born, uh, grow up, uh, get mature, and finally die in order to reinitiate this life cycle is <coughs> in the reality of the exhibition event transferred to the fact that when the exhibition is over, I invite the artist friends and, and visitors and, and you know, uh, museum officers to eat the snails that were, were eating uh, art. Uh, in, in such a way, we, we close again symbolically uh, this kind of cycle. Well, let's go back to damaged pictures. Uh, since then, every time I travel uh, throughout uh, America, throughout Europe, throughout wherever, uh, I intend to visit uh, archives and I try to uh, look for uh, their damaged pictures. For instance, this is in Cuba and La Habana, the National Phototech, and these were originally portraits of uh, uh, politicians, of public uh, people who had uh, some historical um, role. And now it's just, you know, a kind of um, abstract result of uh, uh, chemical leftovers. So, so I'm very interested in, in these situations, huh? how uh, photographs, which uh, are considered uh, devices 
to hold memory, they lose memory. They become amnesic. They suffer Alzheimer. And also, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I was interested in the uh, metaphor of uh, infection. Uh, we are infected by COVID, but the photographs are infected by other kind of uh, uh, microorganisms or whatever. But we all are uh, victims of uh, a disease. Huh? Well, with uh, this kind of uh, archive material, I've been doing different projects. For instance, this was a book uh, called Kintsugi. Kintsugi, probably you know, it's a, a Japanese uh, um, procedure uh, involving Zen philosophy, in which if you have a, a kind of base or plate or uh, whatever in, in ceramic or glass, which is broken, you don't throw it away, but instead you recompose it, but you are not trying to, um, to hide the fractures. Uh, just the contrary, the, the scars are outlined with golden thread because they believe that uh, uh, these uh, scars are beautiful. It's the beauty of scars, the beauty of the ones. And that uh, a piece like that uh, is uh, somehow the document of all the human experience of the people who was using it. So that the value it's even higher. So I, I, I like this poetic idea and start looking for uh, Kintsugi photographs. I was looking for those kind of photographs in which the scars were also very important. I'll show you a few ones and I go fast. Well, uh, I go fast because I want to arrive to a project I'm doing uh, right now in the Gabinetto Fotografico in Rome uh, from the National uh, Photographic Archives, um, the ICCD. I had been invited to do a project with them. And uh, I, I, I found the, the archive, the collection of um, a former um, aristocrat called Poggi, who uh, was uh, uh, an alpinist amateur and a photographer doing um, stereoscopic photographs. And the, the whole collection of photographs is very damaged. And it's beautiful because in, in this kind of uh, uh, problematic uh, situation of conservation, uh, the, the, the images uh, are including or adding uh, a, a new layer of uh, aesthetic uh, significance. Uh, these are photographs from this uh, archive in, in Rome. And the idea is that uh, we are going to do a book and exhibition. We are working on the on the dummy now, and it will be ready, I guess, uh, early early uh, next next year. But what I'm doing in this case is not stopping in this level from the archive. I'm, I, I want to uh, go farther, a step farther. Okay, for the snails, uh, the, the 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 agent destroying the picture and going into the interior into the entrails is the snail, but which are the organisms uh, which are producing this kind of transformation. So uh, I contacted the biologist of the biology department in uh, the Rome University and another university in Barcelona. And we realized that these are the agents that are from a biological point of view, which are uh, fungi and which are bacteria, which uh, produce this kind of uh, strange uh, biological landscape. And uh, with an uh, optical or uh, electronic microscope, I'm photographing uh, the, the, the elements which are at this moment creating this uh, invasion of uh, different shapes, different textures, and uh, expelling the photographic information, which was the uh, original um, content of the picture. So there will be a kind of dialectic in this sense. And in the book or the exhibition I'm preparing, there will be this dialogue, huh? the, the, some fragments of the damaged photographs or the transformed photographs together with uh, the, the, the agents which are the responsible of uh, this, um, this transformation. Uh, let's, let's go farther. Huh? Uh, I, when I'm dealing with uh, 
uh, archives, I realized that uh, nowadays the most uh, universal uh, archive is uh, internet. Internet is a kind of a duplication of the world. And uh, not only that, uh, in 19th and 20th century, the camera was a kind of um, demiurgical uh, tool to uh, prove evidence, to prove reality. Uh, a photograph was understood as something which uh, actually happened. Now, we distrust this uh, way of thinking. And instead, uh, we think that uh, if you want to check uh, a fact, we have uh, Google, or we have uh, these uh, engines which uh, search information. So now, if you want to check everything, we just do a Google search and according to the results, we decide if, uh, if it's true or not. So somehow Google has adopted the um, task that uh, photography had in the beginning. And I'm very interested in, in, in connect uh, this uh, Google uh, aspect, this Google, let's say uh, ontological uh, device with a very antique way of uh, representation, which is mosaic. Huh? Mosaic is a system in which a small pieces <coughs> called tessella uh, are composing a more uh, bigger, a more um, let's say ambitious uh, um, representation. Huh? Somehow this uh, system, which was uh, born in maybe 3,000 3, years ago with uh, uh, Greek, uh, Roman, Arabic uh, civilizations has been readapted later in the history of uh, painting, for instance, by Seurat or by Dali. But uh, in 1996, uh, the, the system was um, dramatically implemented when a student of MIT in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Robert Silver, for his uh, graduation, um, uh, work, um, he, he created, he designed a photomosaic software in which you take a picture, for instance, uh, Marilyn Monroe's portrait, and this uh, picture can be refashioned with uh, thousands of uh, small pictures which act as Tesela. Okay, so um, I, I, I thought uh, this uh, software was uh, an interesting tool to uh, experiment and uh, I wanted to connect this uh, kind of uh, option with uh, the idea of uh, internet as a universal archive. For instance, uh, my way of doing was the following. I took a, a model. This is uh, Niep's first photograph in history, the, the, the roofs of uh, grass in France. Uh, I think it was dated. Uh, 1826. Then I, I, I set this image in the, in the program, in the software, and then I tape some search words and the software, the computer, will connect to the internet and will refashion the original photograph with thousands of images which are available in the internet connected to the, the words of the siege. So for instance, in this case, I just type photo with F and photo with PH. So it was involving searches in different languages, in, in, in French, in Spanish, in English, in Italian, in German, and so on. And the result was that, okay? This is explanation. So if we go closer, we realize that uh, here, uh, all kind of photographs have been used to recompose the first photograph in history. Here we find, I don't know, uh, um, landscape photographs, portraits, uh, advertising, pornographic, uh, uh, medical, scientific, forensic, all kinds of photographs. So the whole history of photography is condensed in, in this kind of photocomposite. So the first photograph in, in, in history is made of all the kinds, all the richness that photography could, uh, could uh, develop, okay? So this was the, the, the idea, how words and images could be confronted uh, 
in order to uh, challenge the idea of uh, internet as a, a visual universal archive. But this could have other kind of uh, political meaning. For instance, this was the Abu Ghraib image uh, of the torture and so on. And in this case, the, uh, well, uh, in this case, the, the search words were all the politicians, all the politician, uh, the military, uh, and, and, and you know, all the people involved in uh, this kind of uh, torture uh, um, situation, this torture uh, scandal in Abu Ghraib. And the result is again, I mean, that if we go, if we go closer, we will recognize uh, some of the people of that time. So the relationships of um, images and words could be uh, set at different uh, levels, at different parameters. It could be poetic, it could be causal, it could be political, it could be just funny. For instance, this is the, the Last Supper by Leonardo, a fragment, and then the, the search word where all the, um, the cook who have been awarded with uh, three stars Michelin. So uh, the, the result again was uh, the, the, the original Leonardo uh, picture with uh, all those uh, famous uh, cooks. Mm -hmm. Or uh, L'Origine du Monde, The Origin of the World by Gustave Courbet, uh, the famous uh, painting. In this case, also uh, joking with some humoristic uh, trend. Well, this is the origin of the world, but uh, the, the search words are Big Bang as a metaphor of the origin of the world, black hole and dark matter. Huh? And again, if uh, we go close, we realize to this kind of uh, things. Okay, well, from this idea, I jump to another one. Okay, why not doing that as uh, public words in uh, open space? And I've been doing photomosaics. Photomosaic is a, a technique uh, rooted in 19th century, in which the photograph is uh, uh, lying is on on a on a piece of uh, ceramic, and it's going to the oven at a very high temperature, maybe 1,000, 1,000 to, to to 200 degrees, and this is absolutely permanent. I mean, it, this this can be resist uh, the rain, the cold. There are not uh, dilatation or contractions, and it's absolutely the, the most resistant photographic technique that exists. And with that, I've been doing different uh, projects uh, in, in uh, according uh, commissions uh, I received from uh, municipalities or institutions. This is, for instance, the Keys in Barcelona, just next to the cathedral. And uh, this was uh, made in 2014. I'm interested in, in this kind of technique, the fact that uh, it involves, again, uh, that materiality I was dealing with before. I mean, we, we are doing something which is very physical, which is very material, uh, which will last as, as uh, the pyramids <laughs> very long. Uh. Let me show you a, a short uh, video, not, not all, but uh, the way this has been done. First of all, these are participative processes. Uh, I request uh, photographs to citizens who would like freely to participate, um, contributing with their images. In that case, uh, the, the, what I requested was pictures which could illustrate the concept of freedom, a moment of freedom. So you will see uh, there was not uh, any kind of uh, discrimination or censorship. People uh, understood freedom in uh, very different ways. For instance, uh, jumping, participating in a, in a political demonstration or just uh, kissing or just, uh, you know, it, it was very, very open. Uh, actually, uh, in order to produce this piece, uh, which was, uh, these are some examples, uh, we received about uh, 16,000 photographs uh, and uh, they were all used to produce the mosaic, but uh, it was not me alone deciding which pictures. It was the, the, the algorithm of the, of the software doing that according um, graphic and, and color patterns of the, of the images. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one of the 
most well known, not the first. The first one was done maybe five years before in a small village in La Rioja region in northern Spain. But um, this has been maybe the, the most uh, popular because uh, now uh, this, this uh, mosaic is uh, the perfect background for tourists uh, taking a selfie. So uh, it's, it's reported in the Barcelona tourist guides and uh, everybody is, is going there to visit. Uh, it's usually a, a quite, uh, quite crowded this is the installation. Let's jump to two different mosaics I've done in Italy. This was done in Gibellina. As you know, Gibellina is a small location, a village in, in uh, Sicily, which was completely destroyed by an earthquake in um, uh, 1968. And uh, after that, uh, the, the city council, the Comune, has invited architects and artists to implement uh, the reconstruction of the new Gibellina. And in order to do that, uh, this is the city council building, uh, Comune, uh, I, I was invited to do something like that, and uh, I decided that uh, I, I wanted to do a, a collective uh, selfie. So uh, I asked for three eyes, the eye of a baby, the eye of a young lady, and the eye of a, you know, a, an elder man. And these three eyes, you know, the three eyes, uh, again, when we go, we go close and close and close, we realize uh, that uh, that uh, it's composed by the, the photographs of uh, all the Gibellina inhabitants who uh, wished to participate in uh, this kind of project, a kind of uh, construction of community, a sense of community. Yeah? And very recently, I mean, just uh, two weeks ago, I opened a similar project in Reggio Emilia. Uh, in this case, it was uh, for the... Um, Museum of uh, Natural History there, where the Spallanzani collection is, is called a wonderful place. I, I, I love it. And, and again, let me let me uh, show you a, a short uh, video uh, dealing with. Uh, In, in this case, uh, since it's a uh, 16 meter high, it was quite complicated and engineers, architects, uh, um, you know, uh, officers from the municipality were dealing in order to ensure that it was safe, that, that it will last forever without any risk for uh, people on the street.
Well, in this case, uh, the citizens of Reggio Emilia were invited to um, translate into pictures uh, their idea of curiosity. And the pictures I received were um, melt, were mixed, with uh, the photographs of the whole uh, collection, museum collection inventory. So all the pieces of the, of the museum were uh, uh, photographed and I use that archive of thousands of photographs to mix with the inhabitants. Uh, so it's a kind of a dialogue between uh, the, the people and uh, the content of the museum, which belongs to the people. Now let's... Let's let's jump uh, to the other side of the border in order to start talking about uh, this uh, post photography and this uh, algorithmic uh, procedure. So let's start with prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is a disease of uh, the memory, which difficults the recognition of uh, faces. It uh, affects uh, one two percent of population. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and uh, the, 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 they don't know. I mean, the, the scientists don't know exactly uh, why this is happening. But the study of uh, this disease has implemented the, the design of uh, facial recognition software. Mm -hmm. So it's close relationship to uh, military and 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 police and, and, and control uh, devices. Uh, uh, the idea uh, originated when uh, I found an archive in Spain of the 30s, belonging to a former uh, newspaper called La Prensa. And uh, the director of this newspaper uh, collected portraits of uh, different personalities, pub public people who could uh, became, um, you know, important for, a, for an article or, I don't know, uh, if someone died, they, they should have at hand a portrait of that person. At that moment, there was no internet, no telegra telephoto, and so on. So we should physically have photographs of uh, the, the, the people who could be, uh, you know, uh, in the front page of the, of the newspaper. So uh, the director of uh, this newspaper collected and produced all these albums uh, in, in you know, alphabetical order, uh, according the activity, the profession, according the um, national origin and so on. Huh? And it was just a functional, a functional uh, archive. What interests me is that, uh, well, uh, in, in the thirties, when you have this uh, kind of uh, situation, one photograph uh, will be used for any episode of your life. For instance, we have a, a photograph of Mussolini. Okay, uh, uh, we will use this photograph, this portrait, to illustrate. I don't know that Mussolini is doing the march over Rome, or that uh, Mussolini is uh, hanged by partisans. Okay? Uh, we have only one picture, so this photograph will will be the, the icon of the whole life of uh, any, any you know, celebrity. Nowadays, uh, the system is completely different. For instance, I, I choose uh, Italian politicians, so you are familiar with them. Now with uh, social networks, you can build your, your public image uh, and change it uh, according your wishes. So you can pretend that uh, you love nature, you can pretend that you love uh, traditions, you can pretend that... Uh, so, uh, according the way you present yourself in the social networks, there's a, a much more dynamic way to transform and adapt the appearance you want to project than that in former times in the 30s when we only hold uh, you know, a, a single uh, physical photograph of someone. So I think that uh, this is also uh, a departure uh, point in, in, in this project. Okay, so uh, with Pilar Rosado, we have been using uh, a new technology, which is quite recent. It was uh, released in 2016, which is, um, which is called uh, GAN, GAN uh, uh, Neuronal uh, Networks. Uh, GAN means Generative Antagonic Networks. 
and it, the, the name uh, could be explained with the uh, following. Mm -hmm. uh, this software is working in two different lines. At one hand, it's taking the archive, all the hundreds or thousands of photographs, for instance, the archive from that newspaper from the 30s, I just displayed some samples, and it's looking for patterns which are regularities, which repeat themselves. For instance, uh, graphic elements that statistically you can find uh, more often than others. And then is starting to create a random combination of these uh, graphic patterns. For instance, colors, for instance, textures, for instance, uh, I don't know, uh, form, shapes. Eh? morphological structures. Uh, imagine that uh, you have a, a software, we should uh, look for a, a Wi-Fi um, password. It will start to combine different letters, different numbers, and so and so, and it will take long, but finally, because of a statistic <laughs> work, it, uh, it, it will arrive to get the precise combination. Well, here, we have images, usually it's uh, 1,024 pixels by 1,024. This means 1 million. Every pixel is a, can have uh, 1 million colors. So we have 1 million, 1 million. Every single image is uh, this amount of uh, possible combinations of pixels. So uh, the, 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 the um, generator um, force is creating these uh, arbitrary combinations. And then there's a, a discriminatory um, task, which is comparing the, the results with the original images. And if we are getting closer, then the next attempts, the next uh, combinations will be done uh, from this departing point. So by a process of trial and error, the software is able to learn how to produce a face similar to the original ones. In order to use this kind of technology, you need a supercomputer. We are using the, the most supercomputer uh, which exists in Spain, uh, which belongs to the University of Barcelona. And the, the, the computer has been working, processing for one month and a half. Every column in this uh, slide is probably separated uh, by uh, maybe a, a week or so. So uh, little by little, the, the, the software is replicating, creating new portraits of people who don't exist, but which could be confused, which could replace the uh, original one. Realize, for instance, these are last results, last output. These pictures are not also uh, of non-existing persons, but they are presented with, um, with the appearance, with the static uh, quality of the newspaper original images. So it's not only creating someone who does not exist, but someone who does not exist uh, presented uh, rhetorically with the same uh, quality of the originals, this is uh, images printed in the, in the newspaper. But also what interests me is that in this process, if we go back, the interesting point is not the, the final result, the perfection. Uh, I, I, I am fascinated by the accidents. I am fascinated, fascinated by the learning process because in, in, in this learning process, uh, we realize that uh, uh, the, the, the software in one month and a half is uh, doing the same evolution that uh, mankind, that humanity, in 2000 years of um, visual art history. Eh? So we go to prehistoric cave paintings, we, we see uh, images uh, which relate to Roman uh, painting from Middle Age, we go to Renaissance, we, we arrive with Expressionism, we uh, can find, I don't know, uh, Bacon, Picasso, and so on. So we could find, because we have now uh, an artistic culture, we can project our artistic models and realize that somehow 
the computer is also uh, producing them. So it's somehow a, a way in which we involve this idea of, uh, of the accident, of the, the, the surreal uh, uh, value of what is unexpected, of what is not perfect, of what is a mistake, or what is just a, a, a step in this uh, kind of evolution. Well, with uh, this work, we've done a book, um, Prosopagnosia, which is uh, designed with this specific type, conceived by the University of uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, which is uh, uh, hence Forgetica, which is a, a special type, uh, apparently uh, incomplete, to push the reader to memorize, to help to keep that in memory. You must do an effort to read this text with this specific um, font, and then uh, this, this effort will fix uh, the information better in, in your memory. This is Aleporello, uh, the book uh, in this kind of uh, uh, structure. And uh, in one, one side, you have the images from the archive, and at the other side, you have the images um, from, from uh, the um, algorithmic process by the Generative Adversarial Network System. And this is presented uh, usually in such a way. Well, the, the, the final result of uh, uh, this kind of software are portraits like the ones I'm showing now. These people don't exist. And actually, they are from a kind of playful um, web page uh, whose title is this person does not exist .com. I mean, you, you click and every time you get a photorealistic uh, photograph of someone who does not exist. Okay, this would be the output, the final result of uh, the use of uh, uh, this kind of process. But as I said, I'm not interested in, in the perfection or the, 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 the gaming of uh, this system, but in the reflection of the process, uh, the, the how the, the sequence is uh, talking about uh, uh, art history, ways of representation, and so on. So I've been applying the same, the same um, process to uh, different ideas. For instance, uh, phrenography, uh, visual atlas of madness. Uh, I was able to access the photographic archive of a uh, uh, psychiatrist uh, from Barcelona in the 40s who uh, was an amateur photographer and documented photograph portrait all his patients in the different uh, psychiatric uh, hospitals uh, he was dealing with. And uh, this archive of uh, different people uh, with uh, mental diseases uh, were used uh, to confront them with their own identity as a therapeutical system. I don't know exactly uh, how that worked, but uh, the, 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 the portraits were uh, a kind of um, um, healthy tool for, for this, uh, these people. In any case, um, it happened that I met uh, this psychiatrist son and I was able to access all those uh, materials. And again, uh, Pilar Rosado and I applied the same system. Yeah? And uh, in this case, uh, it was uh, very, very uh, incredible that this kind of accidents uh, which produce like uh, Francis Bacon portraits and so on. For instance, in, in here you have uh, portraits which are real, which are original, and portraits which are uh, of an existing passions. Uh, and uh, even for me, it, it's very difficult to uh, uh, see which which are real and which are just uh, an invention. And again, I was doing this kind of transformation. Uh, in this uh, morphing uh, video. Another project, Beautiful Agony. In this case, the archive is a current uh, existing web page called Beautiful Agony in Holland. Uh, they display more than 3,600 uh, self, uh, video selfies of people having the orgasm. 
uh, um, men, women, uh, young, elder, and so on. Hmm? Uh, the, the only condition is, according the the web page, is that uh, the orgasm should be authentic, shouldn't be fake. Hmm? So, uh, believe or not, again, you could check with your cell phones if this beautiful agony page is still active. But okay, uh, Pilar and I downloaded uh, portraits of the whole um, repertory of videos. These are real, and again, uh, we were creating this sequence of uh, the different uh, uh, columns, uh, sequences of, of, of the, the, the attempt, the computer to arrive to uh, faces of people uh, having the experience of the climax. And, and again, well, we arrive to a photograph in which we still have this uh, sense of monstrosity but finally, uh, we have uh, images quite uh, convincing. Huh? And, and at this point, after doing that uh, several times, uh, Pilar and I thought that uh, we could go a step further and involved another technology, which is deep fake. With uh, the um, beautiful agony sequence, we learn which are the trends which denote the orgasm uh, expression close eyes, uh, open mouth, uh, this, this kind of ecstasy. Huh? And, and so when we are able to, um, to have this uh, <laughs> control by the computer with deep fate technology, we could um, apply this experience, this knowledge in any uh, portrait, photographic or video of anyone. And then we decided to uh, do that with um, famous people, politicians, who could have had a sexual scandal. And the idea was to buy uh, a video reportage of a press conference or a, a, you know, a talk, a, a speech in a, a political party meeting or whatever. And in, in, in a moment of uh, this speech, the, that person would stop and have the orgasm, and then we keep on talking as usual. Hmm? No, I didn't. I didn't ask him to withdraw, but he walked in this morning. He said it's going to be a rough time for him. Qui vraiment a envie de voir revenir les Juppé et les Sarkozy Qui a envie de voir apparaître les Douste Blasi ou les Raffarin mmh. Mmh. Comment ne pas voir Comment les Français ne verraient-ils pas dans ce carré de vallée quelque chose Abbiamo il problema dei 600.000 e della insicurezza che per risolvere il problema completamente non c'è altra via come dice la nostra legge well, well uh, there are several more people but uh, I think that three is enough to, to get the idea uh, just a, a small explanation uh, this project was done when Pilar and I were uh, artists in residence in, um, in a, uh, an art center in France called Le Frenois, which belongs to the Ministry of Culture. Because of this situation, um, the technical 
issue was uh, difficult, but the main difficulty was the legal issue to do that because of uh, problems uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, um, well, it was the Ministry of Culture, so they imposed some rules. And uh, it's interesting to know which ones. First, uh, this uh, should be, uh, 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 you know, a piece of uh, video uh, bought to the INA, which is the Institut Nacional de l'Audiovisuel, and we were um, uh, forced, uh, we were asked to explain exactly which kind of manipulation we were going to do uh, into the original video. And uh, according our idea that we wanted to introduce that orgasm, we were we, we got the permission, but uh, uh, we uh, get a kind of a compromise of not using that in social networks. It, it should be presented only in uh, art or academic context like uh, right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not able to uh, um, upload those videos in, in my social uh, networks. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, it shouldn't be related to a single figure. So it couldn't be done only with Trump or only with Berlusconi. It should be a category. And we said, okay, no problem. The category is uh, uh, politicians uh, which uh, have been involved in a sexual scandal, which has been reported in the media, but uh, it's, it's objective. We can prove that all of them have been involved with uh, adultery or uh, sexual harassment or whatever. And the third and more interesting is that, that uh, uh, it should be clear that it's not real, that it's a parody. So we're not allowed to use the deep fake technology at 100% of perfection. We should keep at 80%. And then you, you realize, I mean, the, the, the viewer could realize that uh, there's something wrong and that this is just, uh, you know, a kind of, a, a kind of a caricature, a kind of parody. Okay, and now uh, just uh, to finish, I, I go to the Deja Vu uh, exhibition here in Verona, in which we have been uh, applying the same strategy. In this case, we got all the, we, we, we tried to, to get um, all the inventory uh, of a museum. We've done that with several museums, and here we present the Museo del Prado de Madrid, which is the main, main museum in Spain for classic painting, and uh, these uh, thousands of uh, paintings uh, have been uh, digested by the algorithm and uh, has been able to produce uh, this kind of monstrosities, again, which are accidents in, in, in the process of uh, doing that, in the process of uh, recreating, mm -hmm. but somehow uh, this uh, places us in the idea that uh, maybe in the future curators, researchers, artists won't be necessary any longer. The algorithm will do everything for us. If a uh, famous uh, Spanish painter, Goyes Presep, established that the, the dream of reason produces monsters, uh, it is necessary to take on the duty to reverse it and make the monster's dream produce reason. In short, uh, we try to tame uh, those, those visual monsters. Eh? So it's no longer a question of thinking how the photograph is, that of how the photograph is doing us and from where we go to know more carefully what we are and how we are. Okay? But that's somehow the lines yeah, which uh, may explain. So with that, it's over. Let me go to full screen. And uh, now I'm open for our dialogue. Huh?
vorrei, vorrei ringraziarla a nome di tutti quanti perché è stato un intervento densissimo, ricchissimo di, ehm, di spunti e sicuramente anche di molti appunto layers, no? di molti, molti, molti strati di, di, di concetti e di rimandi. Uh, io non voglio rubare tempo alla discussione, quindi uh, innanzitutto dico soltanto che uh, abbiamo molto apprezzato questo, questo excursus nel suo processo artistico che ha cominciato appunto da, 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 dall'inizio, dalle sue ricerche diciamo più sull'archivio e per poi arrivare anche alla, alla ragione, all'occasione che, che la vede coinvolta a Verona e cioè la mostra curata insieme a Pilar Rosado, déjà vu al Grand Festival, eh, che approfitto per ricordare adesso, caso mai mi dimenticassi alla fine, è ancora visibile fino al 22 ottobre, in più questo weekend è anche il weekend della, della Fiera d'Arte Contemporanea, quindi ci sarà più occasione anche di vedere e di circuitare intorno a questi, a questi luoghi. Uh, do allora subito la parola ai nostri, ai nostri discussant, che vado a introdurre, a presentare. Uh, Do la parola per primo al professor Fabio Benincasa, che è docente presso il campus umano della Dickens University. È stato redattore del Festival di Architettura di Roma e ha lavorato anche con il Macro, Museo d'Arte Contemporanea di Roma. È traduttore, ghostwriter, curatore indipendente, collabora con Formiche e con Frontiere della Psicoanalisi. Si occupa di audiovisivo, cultura pop ed estetica. A lei la parola. Grazie, grazie. E vorrei ringraziare eh, l'Università di Verona per, per questo invito che insomma eh, ci consente di espandere eh, un po' eh, un lavoro che con eh, Federico Leoni abbiamo già, abbiamo già cominciato con un ciclo che era dedicato alla metafotografia. Qui stiamo esaminando qualcosa che, eh, sulla scorta del, eh, dei libri del professor Font Hubert è definito post fotografia come capite insomma ci, ci aggiriamo in un'area in un'area periferica eh, che, che riguarda la, uh, la fotografia e il suo rapporto con, con il supporto che è sparito ora appunto vedo un pubblico molto giovane quindi eh, diciamo forse voi neanche vi ricordate i supporti che ci possiamo che ci possiamo ricordare noi però in effetti eh, oltre che il, la questione la questione della smaterializzazione dei supporti e quindi il fatto che giustamente come ci ricorda il professore in, in tutti i suoi libri quello che noi adesso definiamo fotografia non è affatto più la fotografia del, del XX secolo e ogni giorno con, con eh, i cellulari vengono scattate più fotografie che in tutto il XX secolo per cui diciamo con un mare di fotografie che nessuno è assolutamente in grado di, eh, neanche di vedere ormai scattiamo la fotografia a quello che mangiamo a colazione insomma quindi e, e all'ora di pranzo non ci ricordiamo neanche più di averla, di averla scattata e diciamo che oltre, oltre eh, a questo uh, enorme flusso di immagini che non, che non sappiamo bene come sistemare e che quindi eh, pone una serie di problemi non solo ai fotografi in, in, in questo periodo ma eh, anche eh, normalmente agli artisti abbiamo anche, ecco io penso che ci ritroviamo con, eh, con degli amici filosofi a parlare anche il problema della soggettività che c'è dietro Dietro, perché eh, uno, uh, 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 qui ci sono due questioni, una quella di che cos'è la fotografia e, e la realtà fotografica nel momento in cui con un software automatico si può riprodurre una cosa che già adesso somiglia alla fotografia o al video, tra 5-6 anni sarà praticamente indistinguibile probabilmente già adesso sapete benissimo che ci sono questi software di intelligenza artificiale che basta scrivergli di disegnare qualcosa e la disegnano possono disegnarla anche in maniera molto realistica poi passeranno a fare le foto a riprodurre le foto poi passeranno a riprodurre i video e alla fine eh, diciamo per, l'immagine perderà questa sua qualità di, di documento perché si potrà produrre più o meno dal nulla semplicemente scrivendo e, e ricombinando delle vecchie questo flusso di, di eh, assoluto di immagini in, in cui ci troviamo immersi tant'è vero che questo provoca poi delle, delle reazioni nei, nei, negli artisti che spesso sono, sono reazioni di Adesso mi ricordo appunto la mostra 
del 2015 di Berengo Gardin che si chiamava Vera Fotografia dove lui stampava queste foto uh, delle grandi navi di Venezia e ci metteva un timbro dietro Vera Fotografia perché dice che era fatta eh, originalmente da lui su supporto e quindi diciamo eh, si, si cercava di, di recuperare una, una garanzia di realtà a questa foto però concent concentrandosi semplicemente su un procedimento tecnico di produzione come se fosse eh, il formaggio di fossa però il formaggio di fossa poi uno lo assaggia e capisce la differenza tra un formaggio vero e un formaggio del discount con la, con la fotografia è più complicato magari la fotografia fatta finta fatta con, con photoshop viene, viene più bella di quella di Berengo Gardin adesso quindi cioè, eh, diciamo il, il problema non può essere limitato semplicemente può, non, non ci si può semplicemente attaccare a questa, a questa cosa tecnica per, per, e, e questa cosa ormai è, è estesa anche all'arte appunto non, eh, eh, che diventa molto spesso appunto nelle polemiche sulla biennale di Venezia di, di quest'anno si è parlato di Ikea evoluta addirittura in, in maniera molto molto insultante per quello, eh, per quello che c'è stato. E eh, Dall'altra parte c'è un, un problema di soggetti, infatti nelle operazioni per esempio che, che vediamo fare eh, a, a Jean Font Cuberta quando eh, è, è fotografo, c'è una specie di eh, discesa razionale eh, all'interno all all di, di queste immagini, che sono sorprendenti soprattutto per, eh, per la loro irrazionalità, per il fatto che eh, per esempio sono consumate, eh, da, dalle muffe oppure sono prodotte da un'intelligenza artificiale che le produce un po' per conto suo quindi diciamo mesco, a volte appunto le cose più interessanti sono gli errori non quando fa esattamente quando l'intelligenza artificiale riproduce esattamente il volto come gli abbiamo chiesto di riprodurlo magari lo riproduce è, è successo anche a me utilizzando i programmi di, di, di intelligenza artificiale chiedo il, il volto di una bella donna e arriva con due pupille per occhio per esempio perché l'intelligenza artificiale in quel momento si sbaglia e, e sono degli effetti eh, qualitativamente interessanti però appunto qui manca, manca completamente il problema della soggettività artistica quindi appunto la, la soggettività viene inserita per esempio utilizzando il sistema del mosaico eh, costruendoci delle strutture, delle strutture logiche attorno picture in picture altri ma però eh, eh, mi sembra sempre senza mai riuscire effettivamente a recuperare completamente eh, il, il problema che noi spostiamo semplicemente cioè facciamo, facciamo arte con altra arte facciamo fotografia con altre, con altre fotografie ma alla fine non, non si capisce veramente chi, chi è che la fa prima o poi inventeranno un software che fa le stesse cose e, e, e il problema si sposta semplicemente, semplicemente un po' più in là quindi io eh, credo che appunto oltre che un problema, oltre che un problema eh, di, di estetica stiamo arrivando veramente a, a, a un problema forse più esteso più ontologico non so appunto i miei colleghi e il, e il professore cosa ne pensano però se, secondo me è interessante eh, di fronte a questi interventi interessantissime eh, esperienze di fonte cuberta chiedersi anche eh, porsi anche questo tipo di domanda e eh, mi taccio così abbiamo tempo forse anche per, per fare due chiacchiere um, would, would you like I try to speak Spanish or you prefer I keep on English uh, eh... I don't, io preferirei stare sull'inglese personalmente, quindi non so se okay. vedo anche la platea chiede l'inglese gentilmente, professore. Se okay. Grazie. Well, um, maybe... eh, eh, mi, mi dice il collega se preferisce spiegare... In, in... Ah no, prego, pensavo dallo spagnolo. No, so, te, grazie per il suo inglese, Fontcuberta, che è comprensibilissimo, grazie mille. Uh, maybe we are not fully aware but uh, we are in between a uh, revolution. I think that our current uh, situation is similar to that of uh, 1839, when uh, first uh, uh, Parisians, I mean, people in Paris, was able to uh, see, uh, to watch the first uh, daguerreotypes. They couldn't understand how that miracle was possible. It was like a small mirror, but when you have a, a regular mirror, you change the position and the reflection also changed. How this daguerreotype, which was a mirror, could capture the image, the reflection, and make it uh, fixed, stable, hmm? <laughs> and lasting forever. So uh, in terms of uh, you know, anthropological uh, attitude, huh? how this kind of invention could be accepted. A lot of people 
did not understand. Huh? And I think that uh, uh, we, we don't understand the, the impact and the uh, social, uh, static, anthropological, sociological evolution that uh, this uh, will involve, I mean, the algorithms will, will involve uh, in, in, in the future. Um, in, in any case, uh, I'm always uh, uh, concerned with uh, the importance of the meaning and uh, of the intention, rather of the fabrication, the production of the image. Every time producing an image is uh, much more easier. Uh, if we make, if we go back in history at the beginning, for instance, in, in prehistoric caves, only some magicians were able to depict uh, horses or uh, bisons uh, because they had a, a kind of um, um, a spiritual uh, quality to transform the actual nature into pictures. Okay, later there were the artists who were able to uh, create uh, also uh, interesting depictions of reality, but the artists again, uh, they were a, a minority. Uh, they had talent and this talent uh, was not generally uh, provided to everybody. Eh? It was you know, an elite. Eh? Well, okay, then I write photography. It was a way to, to socialize and democratize the, the, the production of pictures. But at the beginning, photography was uh, still quite uh, complex uh, as a technique. Uh, you know, the, 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 the cameras were complicated to handle. The lab work with chemistry was uh, again uh, uh, quite, quite hard and so on. So, of course, there were a lot of photographers, professional photographers, who were able to produce images. But still, it was not something uh, open to everybody. And then uh, Mr. Eastman and Kodak arrived in uh, 1889 and said, okay, don't, don't panic. You, everybody can do uh, uh, an image. Uh, you just press the button and Kodak will do the rest. Huh? So. It was spreading the, the use of image makers, but still there was a problem. Okay, everybody can do a picture, but uh, it, it's having a cost. So you will, you know, you will focus, you will produce pictures only when they are worth of its economic cost. But now uh, we, we live in a completely different situation. Uh, images have cost zero, nothing. So we can do as many as we want. So uh, uh, images or photographs done with cell phones have become, mm, let's say, a, a, a kind of universal language. It's not only a light writing. For a light writing, you need a calligrapher or you need a scriber. You need, you know, someone able to write. But for a language, you can learn it spontaneously. Uh, 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 without any effort, little by little. So we are in a complete different situation. And this is what I, I like to uh, call the um, emergence, uh, as, a, as a funny joke, the emergence of the homo photographicus. Uh, we are all homo photographicus. After the homo sapiens, uh, the homo photographicus species arrived. And uh, this means that uh, when producing images is so easy, uh, the important thing is the content. Now, uh, uh, Fabio mentioned those uh, softwares, those algorithms, which are called uh, word to image, in which with a description, with a text description, you can produce a convincing photorealistic image or even a video. At the moment, a five seconds video. So uh, I can write, I wish, uh, I don't know, uh, Trump flying on the Everest mountain. And I press the button and after I think uh, 30 seconds, I have a, a video of uh, Trump flying over the Everest mountain. So if I'm not happy with the result, I can provide more detailed instructions. The same for photographs, even easier. And I'm, I'm working with those uh, programs. Uh, uh, it's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm uh, producing another project, a book, 
which will be again ready next uh, early next year about dinosaurs. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a science fiction story. Well, it's long to explain, but I'm using uh, these uh, these softwares. For instance, uh, one is Dali or uh, Mid Journey or Dream Studio. They all work more or less uh, under under the same parameters, and it's it's really magic because now. We are at the beginning of this new technology, but little by little, they will be implemented and they will be soon able to provide uh, photographs that uh, could be completely confused with uh, the output of a photographic camera. So this means that uh, the, the, the algorithm and the artificial intelligence are substituting the, a and the eye and the camera in the uh, current uh, visual culture. And uh, this is very important. It will have a, a great impact in, in, in our life, in communication, in, in economy, in politics, in everything. Huh? So uh, let, let's, let's uh, keep attention to that. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's happening. So as soon as uh, we, we uh, are able uh, to, to uh, get familiar with that, will be able to somehow resist the, 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 the impact that the, the, the negative impact that this could have in our lives. Actually, we are talking about art or visual culture, and this is just a, a, a limited section of the whole debate. What's, what's our future? Uh, a future with uh, robots, with visual intelligence, with uh, machines, uh, which will be able to uh, create new machines uh, every time more, more uh, um, powerful. Uh, this is a, a kind of a science fiction nightmare, but uh, we are going towards that. And from the visual culture, from, from the field of images, I think that uh, we should uh, uh, contribute with our reflection and with our uh, critical attitude to all these uh, new technologies. I mean, I, I, I don't refuse them, but we should be prepared for what uh, all these uh, new technological innovations will, will change our, our, our lives. Mi piace questo avanzamento di questa ipotesi dei visual studies come scienza della responsabilità. Questo non avevo mai effettivamente riflettuto. Allora eh, do la parola a Federico Leoni, che molti di voi lo conoscono già perché appunto è docente di, qui a Verona di antropologia filosofica e lascio la parola a Federico. Grazie e anch'io ringrazio molto per la lezione e per le tante questioni che che hai posto sul tavolo. E io faccio una considerazione molto sintetica e schematica e che in fondo è una domanda. Se io dovessi fare direttamente la domanda, forse ti chiederei questo. E che che cos'è l'archivio? Che tipo di uso tu fai dell'archivio e pensi che sia interessante, produttivo fare dell'archivio? Se dovessi articolare un po' di più questa domanda, lo farei intanto facendo un esempio che è un, un po' un controesempio in realtà. Pensando al tuo lavoro sul Prado, quindi alla mostra che possiamo anche vedere qui a Verona, quindi per noi è più vicina, è più accessibile. Cioè tu hai in qualche modo preso questo archivio eminente della pittura europea. Allora mi è venuto in mente Arca Russa di Sokurov, ne parlavamo qualche tempo fa con eh, amici. E come è fatto Arca Russa di Sokurov, che tu senz'altro conoscerai, che spero in molti abbiamo visto? È un lungo piano sequenza in cui qualcuno attraversa l'Ermitage, che di nuovo è un luogo eminente dell'archivio no, dell europeo delle immagini, della pittura, in un altro luogo, non in Spagna ma in Russia, eccetera. E noi non vediamo mai chi sta attraversando questo questo museo per il semplice motivo che siamo noi a occupare la posizione del punto di vista, quindi siamo noi che attraversiamo il museo e vediamo le immagini e questo è un lungo piano sequenza, quindi c'è una continuità, c'è una storia che si ricostruisce, ogni tanto c'è come un'esplosione per cui davanti 
al tale quadro, all'altro, si crea una scena, una digressione e usciamo dal film avendo visto il museo, l'archivio, visto le immagini, avuto la continuità di questa visione e ne usciamo con una storia e in qualche modo un'identità. E invece l'operazione che tu fai mi sembra che funzioni in tutt'altro modo, cioè intanto deleghi qualcun altro a visitare il, il Prado, noi non occupiamo mai quella posizione, lo fai fare a un algoritmo, a una macchina, e poi non se ne esce con una storia, con un insieme, con una identità, con il chi siamo noi dato che abbiamo visitato il Prado, non ne esci con questa linearità identificante, ma è come se delegassi a un dispositivo automatico un processo di estrazione e dall'archivio estrai dei blocchi, delle invarianti, delle ripetizioni, delle insistenze per cui, che ne so, la scena della deposizione oppure qualche altro, eh, come posso dire, mitologema fondamentale della storia della pittura europea. Però là dove Sokurov produce un'unità di un punto di vista e di un racconto e questa unità del punto di vista, dello sguardo e del racconto producono una storia e un'identità tu produci delle estrazioni di materiali grezzi in qualche modo però ridotti all'osso allora è come se l'archivio non fosse di immagini non fosse rivolto a uno sguardo e alla produzione di un soggetto di questo sguardo e di questa storia ma fosse una specie di archivio materiale, le immagini fossero della materia e tutti gli altri esempi che tu hai fatto fanno funzionare le fotografie come del materiale. Il caso eminente è quello dei rullini incrostati no? di ossidazione, di ruggine, di reazioni chimiche, eccetera. Però anche il caso dell'archivio dell'alpinista, perdonami se riferisco in modo un po' impreciso, anche lì è interessante il lavoro dei batteri sulla superficie impressionata della pellicola. No, allora mi sembra che tu faccia funzionare l'archivio come un archivio materiale su cui si svolge un'operazione che più che alla visione, alla costruzione di un racconto, ha a che fare con la digestione, con il metabolismo mm. e quindi con una idea materiale di estrazione di cose più che di costruzione di senso. Non so se questo ti torna o se è una mia, come dire, comprensione tutta, diciamo, delirante, tutta fuori, fuori strada del tuo lavoro. Well, um, let me start with a statement. Uh, behind every picture there's no mystery, there's just another picture. So, uh, pictures overlap in history. Uh, we think with images. So I, I believe that uh, our way of thinking, at least my way of thinking, is, is visual. Uh, I, 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 I work with uh, patterns, with schemas, with, uh, you know, th this means that uh, the, the, the images uh, format our way of um, considering the world and, and, and taking decisions and shaping our conscience. Uh? Um, uh, Bill Gates once said, if you wish to control human beings, you should control first images. And this is not a, a, you know, a, an innocent uh, statement. It's, it's very real. Huh? Politics, uh, economy, um, personal life, work, entertainment, everything goes through the image. Huh? And because of that, uh, we live in an image world, and the problem is how we survive in such situation. And that's our, again, our, our task and our responsibility, huh? because we are image experts or image producers. So, said that, I, I go back to uh, what I uh, already proposed that uh, in our current uh, you know, post-photographic situation, we have two ways. One is uh, trying to find uh, images, representations, visual representations, which uh, don't exist. For instance, uh, the photojournalist, every time the, the, the episode of a war is different. So every, every shot will be necessarily different. 
but also there's another another kind of ecological attitude which I adopt, which is okay. I consider that uh, there are a, a big amount of images uh, which are dying, which are sleeping, <laughs> which are in lethargy. Let's try to awake them and uh, provide uh, another another why, another 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 voice, another uh, speech. For instance, I, I don't like the term of appropriation, which has been uh, important in in uh, uh, history of uh, art uh, during the historical avant-garde, because appropriation means stealing. I steal an image. Now, that image which belonged to that author belongs to me because I have stolen, okay? I like the idea of adoption. I adopt an image as I adopt a child. This means that I don't pretend to be the biological father, but I want this child grow up, get educated, and have a fruitful life. So the same. I, I don't pretend that the adopted image that I take from the internet or from the archive is mine, belongs to me. I don't believe in this kind of property. But I want this picture be autonomous and have an interesting meaning in society, in a, in a social, uh, in a social <laughs> situation. And uh, that's the reason I go to the archive. The archives usually are like, in my opinion, uh, Alibaba caves. I mean, images which has been maybe stolen by thieves, eh? the 40 thieves of the, of, the, of the tale, and they are there, stored, waiting for Alibaba who goes there and finds the treasure, finds the jewel, finds am among the, all this uh, bunch of, of uh, material, get the, the, the <laughs> that piece of, of uh, uh, visual information, which could uh, have other evocations because the, the new context is providing them. This is also an idea uh, very, uh, you know, supported by uh, Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin, when he uh, thinks about uh, the artist of uh, that, uh, like a brocanteur, uh, I don't know the, the word in English, that uh, searching between the garbage and finding something uh, really interesting. Archives are, uh, amounts of uh, information, usually in, in a state of lethargy. So uh, if you are able to get this material and combine it, use it, uh, manipulate it, uh, it's a very uh, richful uh, uh, stimulation for uh, new creativity, for new discourses, uh, for, for, for new speech. and. Uh, I feel that in this idea of uh, um, the metabolism of uh, images, uh, I think that uh, I'm, I'm an example of how uh, those uh, you know dead images can uh, achieve another meaning, can achieve another life. Grazie mille. Eh, do adesso la parola al professor Gianluca Solla che insegna filosofia teoretica all'Università di Verona dove dirige film il centro di ricerca su filosofia e cinema. Ci arriva. Sì. Beh, intanto anch'io da parte mia veramente non posso che ringraziare Ion von Cuberta perché insomma non solo con molta generosità eh, ci, ha, ci ha condotto attraverso il suo lavoro ma anche Um, ci ha dato molti spunti di riflessione quindi io ne, ne, non farò altro che in qualche modo estrarne uno in qualche modo durante tutta la, insomma, la tua presentazione mi ha, mi ha accompagnato che la questione del movimento ecco se dovessi isolare una domanda ti direi la domanda del movimento come un movimento da un lato immanente all'immagine quindi interno all'immagine um, e, e dall'altro lato un movimento che va sostenuto, che diciamo così, l'atto artistico, l'atto di creazione sostiene, dove questo movimento è da un lato forse legato appunto alla, alla storia dei materiali, alla storia delle tecniche appunto, al, 
ehm, a questo approfondirsi di una distanza, no? per esempio, tra l'analogico e il digitale, ma è anche legato a quella che hai chiamato appunto la, la sofferenza dell'immagine, un tema che mi ha, mi ha incuriosito molto, no? questo aspetto del, del trauma, no? del trauma che segna diciamo, tutte le nostre immagini, che non sono mai a riparo eh, dalla, eh, da ciò che segna la loro materialità, rispetto invece a un'idea invece come dire, più diffusa e anche, e anche comprensibile dell'immagine come rappresentazione, quindi di un'immagine che è conoscenza e quindi in qualche modo è smaterializzata. Allora, eh, rispetto, rispetto a questa questione del, ehm, del movimento che eh, da un lato interno alle immagini, dall'altro lato segna tutte le nostre immagini ehm, e che poi conduce, mi sembra, con molta coerenza, da, diciamo così, dall'inizio alla fine della presentazione, eh, sino appunto a questo movimento che è in fondo un movimento dell'informe, che però ci consegna eh, nuove immagini, nuovi, nuove, nuove forme, nuove formule, ehm, dove la questione mi pare appunto che sia stata messa bene in luce, cioè non è mai una perfezione di un risultato, ma sempre una processualità che non ha mai fine, potremmo dire, no? Come questo in fondo anche uh, questo intreccio uh, che um, uh, lega i vari momenti del lavoro sul Prado, mi sembra che lo mostri bene. In qualche modo, non so, a me ricordava anche il titolo di, un, di uno, forse, dei lavori più famosi appunto di, di Foncuberta, che è la furia delle immagini. In qualche modo non è solo la furia di una moltiplicazione delle immagini, ma qualcosa che segna tutte le immagini, quindi una, in qualche modo una violenza anche che l'immagine fa a se stessa e che bisogna fare all'immagine perché qualcosa venga fuori. Allora, ehm, proprio per essere molto sintetici, mi interessava in fondo il rapporto tra questo movimento che segna le nostre immagini e questa idea di accidente, no? Tu dicevi, no, io provo il fascino in fondo per per gli incidenti del, del processo di conoscenza e in fondo come questo movimento sostiene qualcosa che mi sembra di vedere eh, che all'interno dell'atto di creazione e al tempo stesso, lo dicevi anche adesso nella risposta appunto alla, alla domanda precedente, eh, è un atto di resistenza. Allora in fondo com'è che ci si collega attraverso un atto artistico a un movimento che già da sempre nell'immagine, che in qualche modo tende sempre a mostrificare l'immagine, no? in qualche modo a, a levarne il mostro che è in, dentro e che continua a diventare e come lo si fa diventare appunto un atto di resistenza. Grazie. Ok, uh, thank you Gianluca. Um, there are several questions in, uh, in your statement. Um, actually, I, I would like to let very clear that I, I'm not a philosopher. I admire philosophers. <laughs> I would be <laughs> a philosopher. I'm just a, you know, a humble photographer having curiosity for uh, my own practice. Mm -hmm. And from that uh, position, uh, I would like to provide uh, different answers. First, just an anecdotal interesting point. Um, the president of the Deja Vu series on El Prado Museum was another, another project I did when I found that in uh, 1870, the king, the, the queen of Spain uh, commissioned uh, the uh, royal photographer of the period, uh, Jean Laurent, a French one, to photograph all the galleries in El Prado and compose a kind of panorama which was installed on a canvas and it was like a, a turning uh, device. So the queen could sit in her throne in the palace in the middle of that installation and visit all the museum, all the exhibitions without moving herself. So it was a kind of Google Street View Among la letra, no? before. So, <laughs> in this case, the queen was not moving. It was the <laughs> photographic documentation moving around. No? So, the, the, the first question is, who should move? <laughs> uh, are the images moving, uh, having a movement 
uh, in order to satisfy our needs, or should should we move uh, uh, around the images? Mm -hmm. When in that book, the fury of images, uh, I, I advocate to uh, recover the sovereignty of images was uh, just a way to set this uh, dialectic uh, <laughs> on the top of, of the table. Huh? Who, who, who is having the power, uh, the images or us who have produced them and have uh, and have uh, and and are the, the consumers are the viewers. Okay. Well, in in my own work along my career, uh, I feel that uh, the main movement has been in time. Most of my work is a reflection on different chapters of our history or the uh, the history of uh, images and visual representation. Um, usually, I've been go I've I, I've I've gone to the past. Huh? I've been uh, reconsidering uh, different uh, uh, moments in, in the art history. I took different artists uh, to dialogue with them, always with uh, this uh, conviction that uh, images are always uh, owing something to other preceding images. And even I've done other projects uh, not presented in, in this uh, uh, talk uh, in which I explain how, uh, uh, in order to create uh, experiences of reality, actually reality is no longer important. Uh, we 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 go to the images of those realities, not not the realities itself, and that's a, a, an interesting postmodern issue. <laughs> then then uh, I feel that now we are installed in what some uh, thinkers called press. Presentism. So the, the 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 past does not interest us. Uh, it's only the actual moment which is important. And because of that, uh, maybe uh, my my last uh, works are uh, intending to you know advance to the future to figure out what's going on in few years forward with all these new technologies. Not because of what can do now, but what they will do in a few years. For instance, I'm very concerned with uh, neurological studies, which pretend that uh, the visual activity of the brain could be uh, projected outside. For instance, uh, a, a patient uh, is uh, requested to think in a letter. The, the B, and then some electrodes, and uh, this this letter can be projected in a exterior screen. I think that's uh, wonderful. At the same time, very dangerous, yeah? because if this is the the beginning of a new line of research, somehow this uh, means that uh, in the future we'll be able to go to bed, sleep and record our dreams. And next day, we could uh, review our dreams in a, TV, in a TV set. Okay, that's nice, it's wonderful. But at the same time, this means that uh, we lose the uh, last uh, corner of our intimacy, uh, of our uh, privacy. And uh, this kind of technologies uh, used by, I don't know, uh, uh, agencies of intelligence or uh, totalitarian uh, governments or uh, terrorists uh, are uh, terrible uh, risks for uh, human condition. So this is uh, something also to be considered. And regarding um, accidents, um, this made me think of another important uh, subject uh, I've been dealing with, which is chance. Uh, chance uh, as a, um, a kind of uh, element to um, outline our way to consider, um, for instance, art history. In the case of photography, we could establish an historiographic uh, system based on how artists have been, or uh, artist movements, have been using uh, with uh, uh, more or less, uh, you know, uh, conscience, 
the idea of chance or just the opposite, the idea of absolute control. For instance, uh, a photographer, a classic photographer like Ansel Adams, who created the sound system to, uh, which implies a pre-visualization of the image and the, tra the, the translation of a, a scene into 10 uh, values from white to, 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 to black in the, the, the way that the, he anticipated the result. There was no space at all for chance. Chance was something to be avoided. Huh? I mean, uh, uh, he wanted to achieve exactly the image that he had already uh, uh, anticipated in, 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 in his mind. And well, this is a model. Another model is, uh, I don't know, Man Ray and all the surrealists, which uh, were doing uh, experiments in the dark room with uh, uh, solarization or uh, photograms and things like that. And uh, they, they didn't know what was going on. <laughs> and every result was a surprise. And that was the, the the, the rich aspect of uh, this kind of method. So you have two, two dialectic methods and both are have accomplished interesting results. So uh, this idea of the accident um, is very close to my way of working. Uh, I, I like to take advantage of uh, something which uh, I cannot predict. Huh? Uh, and uh, probably because uh, uh, as, as, an, as an artist, I'm not so interested in the result. I'm interested in the process, as you already said. Uh, the final images that I could present in the gallery here uh, in Verona are contingent. I mean, it could be those images or others. The, the, <laughs> the interest or the, 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 what's, what's the, the coherence of the project would be exactly the same. Uh, I don't mean that uh, um, those images presented hanging on the exhibition have no value. Yes, they have. But in fact, to me, these are just the examples, the consequences of a certain process. No? And in saying that, I consider myself as a part of a kind of generative movement in which the generation of uh, images or the generation of meaning is more important than the encapsulated, encapsulated ways in which this meaning is finally uh, adopted, is presented. So I, I consider that the, the, the process, at least in my case, is, is much more important than the artwork. The artwork is just the witness of this process. But what makes us, as humankind, evolve and advance is the creation of these processes, not the uh, anecdotic results that hang in museums or galleries. Grazie mille. Grazie. Innanzitutto vorrei chiedere eh, di almeno la nostra audience che è stata qui tutto il tempo, è numerosa e che non può, il professor Concuberta non può vedere per ragioni proprio di non abbiamo il controller della camera, appunto, vedi la camera, di fare un applauso al suo intervento così vi fate sentire. Grazie. Grazie. E lo ringrazio a nome di tutti, naturalmente se c'è, non vorremmo abusare troppo del suo tempo, naturalmente sono appunto, però... Non vogliamo neanche precludere nessuno da poter insomma dare un rapido commento, magari eh, lascio la parola ai colleghi qui e, e ringrazio ancora per questo davvero utilissimo e interessantissimo al di là delle discipline che studiamo tutti. Grazie mille professor Grazie. Grazie. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao. Grazie.